Welcome to the Living Consciously TV show. I, I am your host, Coach Steve Toth, and your moderator. And I want to welcome everybody to the Living Consciously TV show today, coming to you live from our Denver, Colorado studios. Our theme today is how to get from your beliefs to your own knowing. And let me introduce you to our guests as well as to our cast members. And our guest today is Dr. Jane Simington. She's a therapist and an author and much more. And she's joining us from Edmonton, Canada. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jane. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Awesome. And then we also have Jane Eileen Cohen. She is our spirituality cast member. And uh, she's joining us from the beautiful city of San Diego, California. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. Fantastic. And then we have Jim Gillette. He is also our spirituality cast member, and he is joining us from San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hi, guys. Good to see you. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Jamie Lerner. She is also a spirituality cast member and a self-growth cast member, and she's joining us from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. So here is how the show is going to go. Uh, we're going to have three segments. Segment one we're going to talk a little bit about what is the Living Consciously show is all about. And we do that just for the benefit of our first time viewers. And then in segment two, we'll talk about what are the issues and the problems with people getting from their beliefs to their own knowing. And then in segment three, we'll talk about what are some of the tools and the modalities our cast members have and also our guests that they have used in the past for their clients or for themselves to assist how to get from your beliefs to your own knowing. So with that, let's begin with the first segment. So what is the Living Consciously TV show is all about? Well, for me, it's about really showing the public a new way of being, a new modality in the world, which has to do with being in the present and has to do with uh, being conscious, and that is how we do it, actually, is to be in the present. And the cast and myself are actually taking some risks here, so I want to acknowledge everybody to, to do so, because most of us out there in the world, and I'm speaking from, of course, my own past experience, is that I had situations many times in my life when I knew that I needed to say something, but I stopped. And I stopped because of my fear. So I didn't express who I really am. So what we do on this show is to show the public what consciousness looks like and feels like. Is anything the cast would like to add or take away? Oh, that was perfect, Steve. That's great. <laughs> okay. Take away, huh? <laughs> like pull something out from what you said? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's something that didn't fit. Okay. And, uh, you know, the example would be is that you know it didn't fit, but you didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Believe me, I would say so if I saw that. Fantastic. All right, so let's move into segment two then. And uh, my leading question uh, for uh, Dr. Jane Simington is, what are the things that really get in the way of people getting from their beliefs to their own knowing... But before you answer that question, let's just have you tell our viewers a little bit about what do you feel or what, what is your understanding of what belief means and what is your understanding of what your own knowing means? Well, I think that uh, we need to be clear, at least from my perspective, that beliefs are always given to us by other people. Uh, very powerful others, and we usually start forming those very early in life. So the powerful others around us, our teachers, our priests, our elders, uh, sometimes even the political system, and we take those on without really ever testing them or challenging them. And it's like they become a part of us, and we never doubt them until we move through a major crisis in life, when sometimes then the experiences that we have, and because I'm a grief and trauma therapist, that often means our trauma, uh, we start changing and growing, and we start challenging some of those beliefs because they don't any longer seem to fit 
the uh, picture that we have of ourselves, that growing spirituality that's taking place inside of us. So knowing is uh, a one, it's a bigger uh, relationship that we have with ourselves and with our spirituality, and that comes through experience. So sometimes beliefs have to burn away in order to us to truly come to know who we really are, especially who we really are as a spiritual being. Okay, awesome. So Can what I you add something to that? Please. Um, in addition, I would say that beliefs can be uh, something that happens in the unconscious mind, which is what you're describing, although I would describe it a little differently, as well as consciously taken on. So people do take on consciously beliefs that they, they gain or add to their conscious mind as an adult. And either way, whether it's unconscious or conscious, it's something that you impose upon your experience of reality rather than coming into present moment experience where you get direct knowledge, which is knowing. Well, I see it a little bit differently because I think when we consciously make a choice, that's a knowing. Because when we consciously make a choice, we look at it inside out, upside down, we discern it, and then we decide that it fits for us. So right. that, like uh, me, I, is more moving into oh. knowing. <laughs> okay. Oh, ah. I'll jump in. We okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Jamie, go ahead. You were okay. trying. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, I believe that we always have access to our knowing, and I also believe that we always know. And sometimes it is our beliefs that we have taken on that moves us further and further away from our actual knowing. Uh, absolutely. But. I agree with that. And it's often the crisis that drives us inward to make us take a look at what is our truth? What is that deep knowing that we have always had that has maybe been covered up by the beliefs and, and uh, foreshadowed or, or painted over by something that we have taken on and think is true, but we've never really challenged. But the deep knowing is always there. And in the spiritual crisis, we're searching for that truth, that deep knowing. Yeah. And and for me, I, I sort of have a little, almost a motto that all beliefs are stories. Uh, however they arise, we've sort of collected them together, forming one part of who we are. But it's like we, our identity can be with the beliefs or with our core consciousness. And a lifetime may be spent and used and delighted with moving from the the stories into uh, truth or our true nature okay so so is the world is the world out there the way it is or is it colored by our beliefs well it's very much in my uh, opinion colored by our beliefs because that is our perspective we see the world through a very fine filter and we all see it a little bit differently. And so part of the reason that we see it differently is because of the beliefs that we have and they can be cultural, they can come from our families, they can come from our own life experience. And so even two people in the same family don't necessarily have the same view of the world or the same perspective because something has changed or colored their particular belief or maybe they've let go of a belief that is now painted them for a new knowing. Uh, they're, they're more connected to who they really are. I'd like to add to that, which is, um, I, I agree that the world is very much colored by the beliefs that people have. And the beliefs function, that they're, they're on several different levels. There are individual level where the particular, what I would call limiting decisions or beliefs that, that individuals have and then there are family ones and cultural ones and global ones and ones humanity are holding in place. And the ones humanity are holding in place is sort of the paradigm of reality that, that, that humanity is basing everything on. That, that is, that's, a, that's a part of the evolutionary process in that going from um, avoiding consciousness, which is knowing, to becoming present in the present moment and gaining consciousness, which is moving out of the belief system, is something that is happening. More and more people are yes, becoming more that's conscious. True. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And you can feel the shift. It's, yeah, that's right. I agree. Absolutely. absolutely. 
right. there is a shift in perspective in the shift in the way people are viewing the world. And so many more people are coming into their full truth of who they really are and what is consciousness for them. Okay, so I, I did something different today and I, and I brought a quote uh, for the show, which I think fits perfectly uh, with the theme that we are um, discussing today. So here's the quote. The day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was so more painful beautiful. than the risk it took to blossom. It's a beautiful quote. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with that. Yes, I use I that too. a lot, actually, in my work. So I would yeah. like all of us to focus on, on, until half the hour, on why is it that most people remain in this tight bud? What is that about? I think that... Um, most of us at some point in our development, as we create, um, let's say that the first round of tight bud, uh, it, it's our best effort to, to establish ourselves as we're growing up. And um, then there's, there's the uh, protection and the fear and the need. Yeah, but wait, Jim, wait, Jim, wait, Jim, but we don't, we're, I, you know, I have some grandkids right now that are really young. <laughs> And, and, and they are not in a tight bud whatsoever. Hey, when I was a grandkid, a little kid, I probably wasn't a tight bud either. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about, you know, as, by the time I was a young adult, I had formed a lot of ideas and, it, and contracted, really. Expanded in one way, but I was contracted into a certain type of personality. And from there on, I had to keep opening up and expanding, and I had discovery, and it, and it was it really has been a wonderful journey. But I can look back and, and see the flowering, and when I would hold on to to a self concept or a personality aspect that was uh, tight, I had to protect it, or I just thought it was the way things are. And uh, and then you go through this transition of unloosening and starting to let go that's really the process of opening up to discovery. And I think uh, that we are afraid of how we're going to be accepted. And I think that's why people remain in the bud uh, for as long as they do. And, um, and then when that bud opens, I think that they understand that in fact, there is so much love and, and acceptance out there. Okay, so, so that's how they find out that there is. And yeah. I'd like to add something to it. This, uh, which is the people, and this is perhaps a bit controversial, always go towards their, their self-interest. Whether they call it self-interest or not, they're always going towards what they conceive of as self-interest. So when being a tight bud seems like the best thing for them or in their self-interest, that's what they'll do. And they, they won't do something differently until it's no longer, they no longer perceive it as their self-interest. And the, the, the distinction here is whether what they perceive as their self-interest actually benefits them or not. Okay, great, thank I, you. I, I see that uh, a lot, actually, in my own spiritual crisis and the people that I work with. Um, and I'd like to just offer that when we go through a major uh, change or a broken time in our life, we feel like we've been taken apart and put together wrong. And so we doubt all of our uh, decisions, we doubt all of our choices. So when these uh, nagging questions from soul come up and we're looking at them and we're thinking, does this fit or doesn't it fit? We have gone through such a stage of brokenness that we don't trust our own choices, our own decisions. So sometimes it's safer to stay with what we know than to jump into what we know not of. But soul's nagging won't let us go, and we keep looking at this back and forth. And so we also have this fear, well, what if that other way that I was taught, what if that is right? And what if this new knowing that's coming up for me is not really the way it is. And so we vacillate and we move. And that's why it's called the dark night of the soul or the spiritual crisis. And so I think those things uh, come into place as well when we talk about staying in the tight bud. But that bud is ever expanding and growing. And we sometimes just keep sneaking back. And then we'll take a peek and sneak back and take another peek. 
Okay, great. I love what you're what you're saying about the soul. Uh, you, you guys got to. I love that. You guys got to yeah, let I, I me have a moment. Back to that one you guys got to let yeah. me have a moment here and invite our viewers. <laughs> Maybe. To we'll call, see. To call in. So if anybody out there that's viewing this show right now and uh, we are speaking to your heart, uh, give us a call at 720-222-0158 and just ask any question that you have of the cast or, or our guest and we would be happy to, to answer. So we, we had an interesting conversation actually in our last week's show which I wanted to run by um, our guest, Dr. Dr. Um, um, Simington. Simington. And the question that I have for you is, and especially that you are a trauma uh, specialist, what percentage do you think of the population goes through some kind of a huge trauma at the very beginning of their, of their youth? And I mean anywhere from one to two, three, four years old. Well, I guess it depends on your definition of trauma, but ah. it seems that many, many young people uh, go through a major challenging life crisis. I'd rather have, you, I'd rather have you define uh, trauma because I think you're an expert in that area. Well, it's trauma? usually, a, it has to be, in order for it to be defined as trauma, it's her, a horrific, life-altering uh, experience and so many times if you look at it in spiritual senses people can even feel like they've left parts of themselves behind and so they can struggle for a long time not feeling whole and complete and so the thing that I do is work specifically with people who've moved through childhood trauma and the numbers are great depending on the population that you're working with. I work a lot with uh, indigenous people, so uh, in many cases they have experienced a lot of trauma because of domestic violence or intergenerational effects of that trauma. Do you feel that it's, a, it's just a part of being human? I would like to uh, think that we are moving past that, but I do believe that part of uh, the old world of fear that we have lived through, uh, that probably was a part of the challenge that we were required to face. I do not believe that that is part of the new reality. And so I believe, as we said at the beginning of this show, many of Many, many people are moving beyond that yes. and are coming to more clearly know themselves yeah. as truth. And so I think once we yeah. move through those initial traumas, uh, we don't have to come back and re-experience all of that. Okay. Great. Fantastic. So good to hear. All right, great. <laughs> all right, so, <laughs> all right, so, so how, do you, how do you feel about, um, can we give some examples, like real examples that people can, uh, can, can really, really, feel and, 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 and be with in terms of what keeps us, what are the specific things that keeps us in, in this, in this uh, status of, of being a bud? Like, like when, we, when we born, I, I mean, I, I experienced my kids, my own kids and my grandkids being born, and they, they are really just a beautiful, uh, beautiful human being, little human being, a beautiful flower that's, that's just opening and expanding. And then, and then we con contract later on in our lives, just like uh, Jim mentioned earlier. So uh, can we give some specific example that our viewers may be able to relate to? I, I have an example that popped into my mind when we, when we were just talking, and uh, certainly I've never talked about this publicly, but I remembered, first let me say like in my late teens, and you know, when I was developing, and I wanted to be cool. I, you know, and I studied the idea of what do I need to do to be cool. And then I remember in my early 20s, and I can even remember where I was walking down a specific street, and I had a, a, just a realization. And I, and so I talked to myself, and I said, Jim, you're not cool. You're warm. <laughs> oh. And I like being warm. I'm not oh, designed to be cool. I'm warm. And I accepted myself. And I dropped off a lot of the aspects. I didn't need to be cool. I was safer and more who I was when I was warm. So there's a story of <laughs> developing it. I was adding little parts to my personality, you know, be cool. And then had to let him go to discover closer to who I really am. Uh, what an That's evolved great. experience. <laughs> Just remembered it. 
That's great. So do you feel do you feel that all the tattoos that that the youngsters these days putting on themselves and their bodies is that is that part of that being cool thing? I think it's part of identity. Mm -hmm. And self expression. I Absolutely. think it's a, you know, self expression is very important for people. So it's it's a reclaiming of the painted face tradition that our tribal ancestors have used like it describes uh, it it's an extension of themselves and so it says i'm unique this is who i am i'm special and instead of painting the face like our tribal friends and ancestors did to say the gifts and the talents they had tattoos in many ways are replacing that and have replaced it for a couple of decades now don't you think it's also perhaps a part of rebelling, uh, adolescence kind of thing, where as being, I am different than you, parents or establishment, it sort of comes out in an against way because kids know that it's going to piss someone off. <laughs> I think there's always an element of that. Like, I don't think anything is black or white. We have more gray than, than uh, and so there's always that, how can I use this to win whatever it is that I'm needing to win right now? Yeah. All right, so... Uh, how about some more examples? We have a few more minutes before we can just jump into our third segment. So how about some, any, anybody uh, would be willing to share some, maybe some of your own examples? Well, I, I think uh, I would like to share that um, after my son was killed, I went away to uh, the University of New York to take a course in energy healing. And someone there um, introduced me to the concept of reincarnation, a concept that had not been part of my Christian upbringing. And I remember being very angry at her for even mentioning that because how dare she say that my son may be reincarnated and move in with some other family when we were missing him so much. And so I longed to find out about that. And her words, even though they made me very angry, made me also explore all the literature I could on reincarnation and I began to actually even work with some researchers who were doing some studies on reincarnation and so it really opened up an incredible door for me to start seeing the world in another way. It frightened me a lot because it was so different than any of the beliefs I had ever had but the nagging wouldn't let go of me until I actually began to really study it in depth until it became a part of what is now my knowing. Oh. Very nice. Thank I, you I'm for impressed with that. how I'm impressed with how thorough you are and how courageous you are to explore things right to the bottom. I, I, I saw a video of you where you, you were explaining more about that. You just do that. All, your, your whole life is like that. It seems a very important thing for me not to leave a stone on turn <laughs> when I need an answer. And it's actually what I encourage my clients to do when they are feeling bumped by something that somebody has said, explore it and look at why that's bumping you. Uh -huh. If it isn't important for you, it wouldn't be bumping you. So look at what's under the bump. Yeah, and we're now talking into the solution because this is how you get to your knowing. When you focus in on something and, and get clarity, when you when you're trying to find out truth, when you explore every stone, turn everything up, up, look under every stone, then you come into knowing. I would like to comment on that because <laughs> I have a different thought about that. I think sometimes we focus so much on that that we create a lot of resistance within ourselves and then we're actually blocked and unable to get to the knowing. And what I, is resistance? What do you mean well, I think that some people hold their beliefs so tight mm. and, and the explaining of their beliefs to themselves and others creates the kind of resistance that really doesn't allow them to... Can I say something about that? Sure. I think it depends upon whether the exploring is meant to prove that the belief is true or the exploring is meant to find out truth. So yeah, there's a difference. Sure, yeah. I think big, there big is difference. a difference. But I think in the exploration, there tends to be resistance. And so I have found that something different in terms of feeling that every stone needs to be unturned. Um, I think that there is another way to get to uh, that knowing. 
So I think that depends on what kind of person you're dealing with. If that person it really needs answers, so if they spend a lot of time in their light, left brain, if they're an academic, they really need to turn a lot of stones and look underneath them. If they tend to spend a lot of time in their right hemisphere, they can move more quickly into the experiences, but sometimes people need a lot of information before they're going to move in another direction. And so they take some information and then they step forward. I think that sometimes the information and the exploration of that information doesn't allow us to move forward because what we focus on is what we continue to attract into our experience. And it's very difficult until you're able to focus on what that moving forward is. Um, it's very difficult to focus on what was and also move forward. That is just in my experience. So thank you. Thank uh, you. I, I like to tell people when when something comes up that may not fit with their belief system, but yet it, the nagging is there, it won't go away. I tell them, talk to people about that who believe as you now believe, but also talk to people about that who believe very differently than you believe or maybe believe in that other concept so that you can discern, so that you can find some oh, balance. That's nice. Does sure. anybody have an example of that on the, on the cast right now? Of what? Well, for example, I mean, exploring. I mean, exploring. For me, exploring is extremely exciting. To really sort of zero in on what is truth, it's like it's just blissful to me. I love doing it. I don't get resistance. Uh, you get resistance when you're going flying when you're exploring in a way to try to prove something is true that's not true. To hold in place a belief system, which is what Jamie's talking about, I believe, which is what most people would probably do. Um, but I don't but, call that exploring. Yeah, I don't call it exploring either. That's it's keeping your eyes closed and trying to hold it hold in place of a belief. It's not exploring at all. Would you say that it's, it's accurate that if, if we don't know who we really are, it's really p pretty tough to move into this thing that you call your own knowing? Because I, I think that a lot of people um, would be fearful to let their beliefs go because they wouldn't know who they are. It would frighten but them. But we all know who we are. We all intuitively mm -hmm. know who we are. Yes, I mean, we do. That is, yes, we that's do. That's a fact. Yes, sure. we do. But for a period so, of time, for a period of time, we may forget. Well, we might, we do. We lose our way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that concept of that nagging, I, I don't remember what you were calling it, Dr. Jane, that um, you know, I, I call it our inner being tapping us on the shoulder repeatedly. I think that is our reminder that, in fact, yes, you know, we do know. We do know. And who would know better for us than us? No one. So well, I, I actually really value your question because uh, it's, I see that frequently at the beginning of he, uh, when people are trying to heal from grief or trauma. I know that that experience is probably going to shift them and shape them spiritually. But at the beginning, I would never say that because most people right now at the beginning of their experience think they are just fine the way they are. And if I should say yes. this will change you, you will grow, because I know from working with thousands of people that those kinds of experiences, crisis drives us inward there to explore and remember. But it takes a lot of courage to, to take those first steps, because at the beginning, people uh, l live in oblivion, really, but they're very happy in that because they don't even know it's oblivion. <laughs> and it's true, and it's not yeah. our place to no. in any way ask them to shift out of that. And, and I remember, actually, years after my healing journey began, after the death of my son, I remember one day feeling, I've woken up. And, and I, it's, it was such a deep awareness for me that something now was very different and that mm. I was who I was. Really, yeah. And there's no way to go back, right? No, because that's <laughs> knowing and, it's a and one you're way. now in. It's a one-way street. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's that expanded consciousness that we finally have re-stepped into. Yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. So, so what, are, what are more of the tools and some of the modalities that we can share with our viewers how to get to that place of your own knowing? 
Well, one of the things I would like to bring up is getting back to that really nice phrase that I think we all liked, the uh, nagging of the soul. Um, I think we should have a daily practice, and I, and I really believe in meditation, but but something that we do regularly that isn't even aimed at working on ourselves, but rather more being still, letting go, and always sort of watering the roots so that the soul can be heard when it nags. Uh, we, we, it's not a thinking process, it's an allowing process. So any kind of daily practice that a person develops and can be a collection of different things, sometimes sitting in meditation, sometimes uh, how you process discomfort throughout the day, but something that always works in the background to allow more of the true voice to be heard. Nice. I awesome. agree. Uh, the soul loves tranquility. Yeah. And we have to find that space to make it quiet. Well, and there's a lot quiet. of people that don't want to, to hear their own knowing. So they spend a lot of time in distraction. And and I, I really ask my clients to at least identify that they've made that choice to uh, move into that place of distraction. So at least they can acknowledge that when they're ready to hear and be tuned into their knowing that that will be available to them. So yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Jamie. I think that, that the route towards to getting to the knowing is to acknowledge where you are, wherever that is. Yes. And then as you acknowledge where you are, then you realize that you want to go deeper. And then when you acknowledge where that deeper is, then you end up going deeper. It's like following the breadcrumbs, <laughs> you know. So wherever you can get a hold of where you are in this moment and own it and recognize it, that is coming closer and closer to the present moment, which, which is where you find knowing. Yes, I think that's true. Yeah, would you also say that um, our intuition is one of those tools that would connect us to that knowing? Yes. Absolutely. Yes, and you've never heard anyone said, I shouldn't have listened to myself. You always hear people say, I should have listened to myself. So right. it's interesting. We are never wrong when we listen to ourselves. Yeah. So One way that I help people pay attention to their intuition is to uh, pay attention to um, any tingling or response that their body has, because I remember going through that and my, my left leg would just start to tingle and I became aware to pay attention because there was a deep truth going on here. And so I teach people to pay attention to bodily responses uh, because often there's a very deep truth there and it's awakening something in them which is very intuitive. At a deep level, uh, at a very deep subconscious level, that that is being they're being reminded. Pay attention. Yeah, I really like any uh, uh, encouragement to listen, whether it's a sensing within the body or you know the subtle little intuitive uh, inkling that comes through. Uh, just uh, pay a little bit more attention to the subtle messages, and then use that to start getting closer to what it's trying to say. And the repeated messages along with the subtle. Yes, yes, the repeated ones. Sometimes for years and years, yes. <laughs> yeah. We've all been there. <laughs> yep, yeah. And the synchronicities is another one. I, you know, I'm not sure who I'm quoting, and I know this isn't mine, but I, I heard once that synchronicities are God's way of remaining anonymous, and I really believe it's the higher self, the spiritual, remaining anonymous, and uh, so synchronicities, repeated, the tinglings, those little awarenesses are, yeah. are truths trying to get through. Yeah, I, I always feel no matter what happens, there's a reason for it which is, a, is how to really deal with things that appear to be negative if you look at it from a larger perspective of what, what is life trying to teach me? What does this mean? And really coming into knowing, knowing is not of, has to do with not avoiding. Whatever it is that's in front of you, if you don't avoid it, if you look square at it, as, as more and more focused at it as you can, things open up. It's like walking through clouds or things becoming more and more transparent. Um, if you're afraid to look, you're closing your eyes and it's like all kinds of, of subterfuge and you can't see what's there. But when you look, things open up. 
And is, then there's also people's concern about once they see it, that they have to take action. And so I remind people that you can see it and not take action. You can wait until you are in alignment with whatever you're seeing and maybe never choose to take action. So there is a way to come into your knowing and be conscious and choose to do absolutely nothing about it. And, and that's okay too. Of course, coming into your knowing already is doing something. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah. So what about what about what about if he continuously and one of you just said this, um, and that's what reminded me to mention this. What if we keep coming up with something that says, "This is something I should do," but there is a stronger sense within me that says, "No, I'm going to avoid it at all cost." Now, is it? Is it accurate to say that usually most of the time what we're trying to avoid is what runs our life? Yeah, I think anytime you're, go ahead. No, you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anytime um, you're, actually I think I forgot what I was going to say. Every time you are closing your eyes and not looking at something, um, that is then your unconscious mind takes over and it does run your your life um, the avoidance is always the problem if you're not avoiding something that's where your power is then you become empowered to make a choice you don't have a choice when you're avoiding something because an unconscious process takes over when you're not avoiding then you get into the driver's seat yeah, but i, I like to honestly oh, like say i am avoiding this <laughs> and, and I think that's okay as well because I think to know that you're avoiding something or to procrastinate or any of those things, it's the, the ability to consciously acknowledge that you're yeah. in where you are in that moment. But and that's not avoiding. So that's so exactly what you're saying. When you consciously acknowledge you're avoiding something, you are uh, in your power. You are taking an action. You're right. That's correct. To, well, let, to, me, let me take that a step in your, Go ahead, please. Go ahead. What, to say that I am avoiding is a decision, and there is power and action in that. But I think we, if we are going to come to our own knowing, then we need to ask, what is the avoidance about, and why am I avoiding? And then we need to look underneath that, because really, I like to base my life on the fact that I really believe there are only two emotions, love and fear. And if it's avoidance, what am I fearing? And what do I need to do about that? And maybe I don't want to do anything for a time, but that's not going to go away. And when we keep coming back to that avoidance, avoidance, uh, we need to look at what is the fear underneath, because that fear underneath is probably a fear-based belief that I have received and have within me since very early in my life. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's I let's, agree let's do. Let's, really... Instead of speaking hypothetically, let's just. Take... I'm going to give a real example here. Please. It's not hypothetical. Okay. Good. Uh, because I, I've been involved with the Enneagram for some time, and I'm a seven. In case any of y'all uh, know your own uh, style or type, but I've part of my characteristic is to avoid. Uh, uncomfortable or bad feelings. I mean, I, a lot of my mechanisms are based on uh, positive attitude and going to the next thing, you know? So what I have been doing, just experimenting for me, and it may not work for everybody, but when I get to uh, a painful uh, little noticing something within me or fear about what could happen in the future or something like that, I now... I live in that, I penetrate it, I feel it, I, I experience it deeply so that the energy that is attached with the feeling that comes up with the fear comes up into my consciousness, then I can actually dissipate it instead of suppressing it. So I use avoidance as a way of just, just uh, you know, sort of staying in a better mood. Now I'm going into, and it's very uncomfortable, I don't like it at all. But within about 15 minutes, I dissipate some but energy you, that, yes. that probably would have stayed there and run me, you know, in certain yeah. patterns. So that's yeah. the way I have found to and, start and, releasing some of that. And the, re and okay, the reason so, it works so. is because when you get into it, you find out it wasn't true. That's what you always find out. Limiting decisions yes. are never true. Okay. And so I do something completely different. On, I never go there. <laughs> yeah. Ever. <laughs> 
Hang so on, guys. It, it, Hang on, guys. Time out. Let me give you a real, let me give you a, let me give no. you a real example. Okay, a real example. Wait a second. Okay. That's what I gave. <laughs> let, hear me out, and then then okay. then, I'll, then you'll see what I'm talking about. So here is a real example. Okay, my birthday was on March 11th. My Colorado driver's license has expired on the day of my birthday. Now. Five years ago, I have gotten a speeding ticket, and I have never paid it. I never went to court. I basically ignored it. Now, guess what? Because I grew up in a communist country, I have, I have developed an automatic fear uh, against authority, and this is something I'm still dealing with. And when I got the ticket, I can remember very clearly how much it pissed me off. Because to me, when, a, when I see a policeman having their lights go behind me in my mirror, I start shaking. Because when I was a kid and I was a teenager, I've got beaten up by the police weekly. And I still haven't completely forgotten all of that. It's still in me. It's still in my system. So I, when I was a young kid, I become very rebellious. So guess what? This ticket I got five years ago, I rebelled. And I said, guess what? I'm not going to pay it. I'm just going to ignore it. So guess what? <laughs> I need a driver's license, OK? And I can't ignore it no more. Cause, and I have to deal with it. So on Tuesday morning, I am going down there, doesn't matter what, including the possibility that I may go to jail. So that's a real example. OK, Jim. so I would like to suggest to you that before you march down there, that you ask yourself if how you're feeling has anything to do with your now. Because I think that if you would ask that simple question, the answer would be no. That how you're feeling does not have anything to do with you, your now, your life, or anything about where you are. And then I would like to suggest that you reframe that situation for yourself that, so that you can go down and take care of this ticket and get your driver's license and feel good about the whole entire experience. Well, I'm going to go down and take care of it, doesn't matter what. Well, but that's why not the point. The point was. Take care of it. The point feeling was. Good, as the opposed to the point, feeling bad. Yes, the point was, I'm not feeling bad. Oh. You're, you're making that up. I, the point was, I was giving a real life example from my own life. And guess what? I know that you are all human beings, just like me. You put on your underwear the same way I do, and your socks. You have all these things in your history, in your, in your story as well, in your life. Yes. But we're still resisting sharing it with the public. So I'm taking leadership, and I'm sharing one of my, one of my messes. We okay. all got messes. Yeah. Let's right, not pretend. Let's not pretend that we don't. Right, you know what? Each that's, in our own way, we're trying to do that. And what I like is that, like Jamie, you have a son. You just said something that can be very helpful for certain listeners, and Steve did too, and maybe I did, and, and each one of us here. And that's what I like about the show. I mean, we're sort of like agreeing that we're going to towards the truth. But I can just say in my lifetime, I've gone through so many different, I have found different processes that would help me through one decade or something, you know, and then something new emerges. And I, I want to be open. In other words, when you started speaking, Jamie, I was very interested because it sounded pretty different from what, what I had said. And I want to be open to what I might learn when you're g giving the advice of how to deal with that. So I, I just think it's all excellent. And no one here is trying to, to have the ultimate truth on how to get well, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're all well. We're all doing just fine. I and think. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but guess what? Guess, Some of us but, need a but new guess, driver's guess what? Some of us, Yeah. <laughs> but, but guess what, guys? So five years ago, if, if I would have asked the question of myself, which, which I'm going to share with you right now, which, which is how I live my life today, is I would have asked myself the question, is what I'm about to do or say, is that in the best interest of who I really am, a Steve Toth? And that, answer, that question would have connected me back then to the real me. And that's what we're talking about today. You know, we're, talk, we're talking about exactly that. So 
if I would have asked that question five years ago, what I would have done is what is in my best interest, which is to go ahead, go to court, do whatever I need to do, pay the bill, and move on. Because guess what? The fact that I didn't, it has cost me in terms of my energy. It has cost me for the last five years because it's nagging me. Who used the word nagging on the show? Dr. I did. It's been nagging me for five freaking years. Well, you have a high tolerance. Okay. <laughs> that's all there is to it. And that's okay. But you have also identified a very important tool that the listeners can use and we also all can use, which is to ask a simple question. You know, does yes, this and, serve and I don't need me to, in the I, best interest? Yeah, and I don't need to create these. Uh, these are little mini dramas that we create in our lives to, to keep our, I think, alter ego or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> busy. Um, or, or give the, 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 the driver's seat back to our non-conscious, unconscious mind. Because well, I think it's more than that. It's, it's, I mean, you just received a huge soul lesson through going through that experience. It's not just a made-up thing for no reason. It's not just a drama just to occupy yourself. This is, this is a, a, a very important pattern for you that you've just now made some huge progress through. That's how I see it. Yes, and that's how I see it, too. And if I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing um, with this show and with all of you, you know, I, I could probably keep that little story going for longer, which would not serve me. And that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know... Okay, so, so here's the message I have. So I'm not the only human being in the United States that have done what I just shared. No. Guess how many thousands of people out there that have got a ticket and didn't pay it? There's got to be hundreds of thousands. Yes. Okay. And? So, so I, I would like to suggest that if, if you are listening, if you are one of those people and you listen to the show, you go, oh, wow, that's really, that's really cool. So if I ask myself the question, is continuing that behavior, is that in my best interest? I don't think so. Do you think it is? It well, depends. Number one, I don't see that as bad behavior. Uh, but I think that um, we need to be a little bit cautious uh, to the listeners in the fact that um, sometimes choices that we make to do nothing are actually in our best interest. And so I'm ah. thinking that, you know, you started your story, your scenario, by telling us about your childhood being abused by the police. Well, there are many people in this country and in this, on this continent who have, uh, could tell similar stories, whereas if they took the action that you have avoided and they take the action because they think it's in their higher interest or they don't want to live in fear, they can indeed become incarcerated, maybe in a, a prison that will keep them there for the rest of their life. So I think we have to be careful because there is discernment here as well that needs to be brought into the picture. It's not just that avoiding something or not avoiding something okay. is the equal spirituality. So uh, what is in my highest and my best interests uh, is a, a question that sometimes we need to ponder for a long period of time. And so sometimes avoidance, as we said earlier, is in our best interest until we can gather all of the facts, all of the information. So if I were working with you years ago when you were struggling with this, I think looking at the truth rather than looking at the fear, what is going to happen to me because that fear was based on your childhood experience. But what is the truth of your reality right now? And then what action do you need to take? So it's yeah. not just avoidance equals spirit or no spirituality and not avoidance equals uh, best choices. I think we need to be a little bit uh, clearer and separate that out a little clearer for people. I agree. And, I, what, I, and I, what I was giving you is my story. And, and everybody has a story. And that yes. doesn't mean that the story is the truth, does it? Well, it's well, your I, truth. I, it was your truth. Your story I, I, was your truth. I think the point here is that there isn't a formula way out of what, one situation or another. It's really the difference between whether you're following your inner guidance 
what, what your soul is prompting, or you're following an emotional defense system. So if you're going, it's a question of whether you're actually going towards truth or avoiding truth, which leads to whether whatever you do is going towards a solution or in the opposite direction. Okay, so for me, not. so for me, so so I can see for me that that I, that this took me five years to resolve. It was probably perfect, just the way it happened. Yeah, and yes, now, it was perfect. It and was perfect. now, and now, it's 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 changing because I'm a different person than what I was five years ago, and I have grown yeah. a lot. And now, I can no longer tolerate something like that. That's all. That's just what my truth is today. Right. And so truth can shape and truth can grow and truth can change. Absolutely. I just wanted to share a real story, that's mm -hmm. all. Yeah, it's a great story. <laughs> it's a good story. We liked it. <laughs> Instead of speaking hypothetically, which we all like to do. <laughs> so I think we're all vulnerable as human beings. We all do things. Okay. And, and the purpose of the show is to share that with the viewers because... You know, we're not sitting on some on top of some some hill, you know, being the guru um, that we know it all. Because I don't, I know nothing. The, but the we more do I, know it for ourselves. The more yeah. I, I go into all these all these things and all the knowledge and all the wisdom that I have, the, the less I, I feel I know. Because I don't really know anything. Matter of fact, I I love to live my life now, leaving all these stories. Just let them go because. They no longer serve me. These stories no longer, they used to serve me, <laughs> but they no longer really serve me. I, I just want to live a full and complete life where anything is possible from a place of love and from a place of connecting to myself and to you all and to the world. That's the kind of life I would like to live. And I'm I, doing I it. Find, I find that it's very comfortable to say, I don't know. I was some years ago when I, I said to myself, I think I'm closest to the truth when I can tell myself I don't know. And that was quite a, uh, something I needed to go through because I guess I had been in uh, you know different positions where I would sort of dogmatically be the mouthpiece for some set of beliefs. And uh, as I started letting go, it was comfortable. And I still live that way. I, I don't know, but there's a knowingness that comes when you can say, I don't know, with the former mind that used to put the structure in your life, now you let that go. And the knowingness has a sense of openness and not knowing, but you're open to, to the future. You're in the present and possibility. Yeah, right on. I always say to myself and to other people, I only know for myself. And, and, it's, and I do always have access to that knowing, but only for myself. I only know for me, not for another. So, um, well, that's what knowing is. It's personal yeah. truth. Yeah, that, that that's is right. very powerful. Yes, absolutely. It's, I, I call it standing in the question, which is saying, I don't know. I don't know what this means, and therefore I don't know how to interpret it. But it's doing is creating an opening or a gap where truth can come in, as opposed to filling it in which, with beliefs, which is what we were talking about before. Fill it in with beliefs, there's no space for truth to come in. But isn't that isn't that one of the one of the interesting controversial things with religion? They they for some reason seem to be the authority knowing what's good for you. <laughs> si silence. <laughs> there is silence. Oh. I dropped the bomb. Well, that's like a topic for a whole other show, I, I believe. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, it's the bomb. It's just you know. Uh, it was that we, right, but then we get into the difference between spirituality and religion, between dogma and coming into your own direct experience of the divine. So, yeah, it's a whole big topic. <laughs> well, it, it just, yeah, well, that, that came from somebody was just sharing with me this morning that called me from Mexico that, that the Pope happens to be in Mexico. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and I initially didn't know about it until, until this person said something to me because I, I, I don't have a huge, uh, you know, thing going on with the Catholic Church, so I don't follow what they do. But um, that's just me. All right. So um, 
Is there anything well, one else? One of the major things about religion, if I can just throw a thought in here, is that they need followers. And in order to need followers, you need, uh, you need a belief system that keeps people following that belief system. And so that's what happens often to people in the spiritual crisis, because they start stepping out of that belief system because their experience doesn't fit it. But as Jamie said, then they maybe are shunned by their peers or their friends. And so that's one of the fears that keeps us tightly back into that system. Yes. Now, on and the other so hand, there's, 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 a, there's a benefit from having belief systems when you're completely at sea and you don't know how to structure your thinking at all. It, and to me, this is part of the evolutionary process. People needed to be told at first what truth is because they had no way to access it. And that's sort of like being a child and going to an adult where then you can directly experience it. And then you can't stand being told what's true when you know perfectly well because you can access it yourself. You don't want someone to try to tell you what your experience is. Great. I, I, I agree you. with you. I think it's an evolutionary process, uh, religion to spirituality. Believe it or not, uh, we are out of time. And really, that's all the time we have, we have for today. And uh, it did seem like, you know, two minutes. And so I'd like to extend many thanks to our, our guest and also all of our cast members and the crew behind the glass, including that wonderful 11-year-old out there. And uh, remember to, uh, to vote on all of our shows on Channel 56, 57, and 219. Uh, the more you vote, the more our shows are played on Comcast. And also interact with us at, and, and engage with us at www.leadingconsciously.tv. I love you all, and I had a great time with you. And uh, until Thank next you. time, uh, always the same day, same time, Saturdays afternoon at 3 o'clock. Thank you so much. See you guys next week.